order. And we have the occasion to thank you. <laughs> We're a team up here. Yeah. Uh, to indicate our presence electronically. So please uh, vote yes to indicate your presence. And Madam Clerk, we do have a quorum? Yes, sir. Thank you. Our first order of business is two appeals from the Historic Preservation Commission. And I'll explain the format. We allot a half an hour for each appeal. Uh, the appellate, uh, the person making the appeal, has five minutes. And then uh, the Historic Preservation Commission has five minutes. And the remaining 20 minutes will be left to council to discuss that. This is not a public hearing. Uh, the public hearing has already been held by the Historic uh, Preservation Commission. Uh, any decision by city council, of course, can be appealed to the circuit court. Any questions on the procedure? Okay, the first appeal is an appeal uh, pertaining to the property located at 239 Maryland Avenue. And Ma Madam Clerk, would you uh, read the uh, request, please? Yes, sir. Uh, Sean Samuels seek to appeal the Historic Preservation's decision to deny his request to construct a four-foot wooden fence in his front yard located at 239 Maryland Avenue in the historic Port Norfolk neighborhood. Uh, does the applicant have a representative here tonight? Sean Samuels. Okay. Uh, historic Preservation uh, Commission, and I think Ms. Browley. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor you, Rowe. Ha you have five minutes. Okay. Mayor Rowe, Vice Mayor Cherry, City Manager Dr. Patton, City Attorney, members of the Portsmouth City Council. I'm Lynn Browley. I am the Vice Chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. And I am here to present the Commission's rationale for denying the request to construct a front yard fence at 239 Maryland Avenue. And our rationale is thus based on historic preservation guidelines solely. The Port Norfolk Historic District Guidelines prohibits fencing of front yards. It is considered inappropriate. The guidelines encourage an open appearance of connecting grass front lawns. The guidelines recommend that property owners fence rear yards starting at the rear wall of the house. And that is solely our rationale for denying this request. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions? at all. Because the applicant is not here, uh, do we want to defer this until we consider the next one? Or what's your pleasure, counsel? Are you ready to go ahead and consider this? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Councilman Moody. Was, was the applicant uh, properly notified? Mayor, can someone speak to that? Uh, Madam City Manager, do you know? Or Madam Clerk? Uh, Mayor, I will yield to Mr. Bowen, Planning Director. Um, good evening. Um, from uh, talking to uh, Jocelyn Adumwa, who's our Planning Manager, who is our staff uh, support to the um, HPC, she indicated that uh, numerous attempts have been made to uh, contact the applicant, but has not received a response. Thank you, sir. What's the pleasure of counsel? You ready to consider this matter? Um, if he was notified, didn't, didn't show. Is it going to do it now? 
Councilwoman, Councilwoman Simmons. Uh, yes, Mayor, could you have the clerk remind us uh, what the motion is to, uh, how to phrase it if you want to uphold or deny what, I'm not sure how to make the motion. Sure, Madam Clerk. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. The motion from the commission is to deny. So if you're in agreement with them, you will concur with the recommendation of the HPC for denial. And you will vote yes on that motion, unless somebody does the opposite. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to concur with the HPC to deny. Second. Okay, we have a motion that's been made and duly seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Everybody clear on the motion? The motion is to upheld, uphold the mm -hmm. denial mm -hmm. of the HPC. Okay, ready for the question? All in favor, vote yes, opposed no. Madam Clerk, the motion carries. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. The next is an appeal 34 Afton Parkway, and Ms. Brownlee, will you uh, explain the appeal? Yes, good evening again. I'm here as the Vice Chair of the Historic Preservation Commission to explain the Commission's rationale for denying the application of Holy Angels Roman Catholic Church, 34 Athen Parkway, to make changes to their exterior tower. And our rationale <coughs> is that the bell tower is a defining feature of the church. Therefore, great effort should be made to repair it. While the structure is considered non-contributing based on the fact it was constructed in 1950, its unique bell tower and its ornamentation contributes to the architectural features within the district. Truncating the tower would significantly change the building, which is a landmark in the community. The 40-foot tower is a major defining feature of the church. It is quite prominent and contributes to the historic character of the Craddock Historic District. This commission suggested that adjustments be made to the repair schedule that would allow the restoration or the retention of the tower. The tower is very visible and can be seen from various locations within the neighborhood. To that end, the Historic Preservation Commission denied the request to shorten the tower and remove the decorative stonework, loos, lintels, arches, and other features of the tower. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And at this point, before I call the applicant forward, uh, Madam Clerk, would you read the nature of the the request, please. Yes, sir. Joel Andre, Andre Marquise Architects, seeks approval to tourniquet, tourniquet, sorry, the upper portion of a 40-foot tower of Holy Angels Roman Catholic Church located at 34 Afton Parkway in the Craddock Historic District. Thank you. And now we'll give the applicant five minutes. Uh, one speaker, please. And again, this is not a public hearing. And sir, uh, would you state your name for the record? My name is Joel Andre, Andre Marquez Architects. I'm speaking for Father Anthony uh, Morris, who's the uh, uh, pastor of the cluster, being Holy Angel, St. Paul's, Resurrection, and uh, St. Mary's in Chesapeake. Um, we have a situation where uh, We have limited funds to repair the church building. Uh, and it's a question of where the money should be used. Repairing the, the tower, which would be a, a valiant thing to do, because it is a significant architectural feature on the church, then, but allowing the sanctuary, which is where the lifeblood of the church happens, um, and the connection from the sanctuary to the fellowship hall, 
to deteriorate because of lack of funds um, would defeat the purpose of providing a place where the worshipers can attend and fellowship and uh, uh, participate in their faith life. Um, it is a challenge architecturally. As an architect, as, as <laughs> uh, a former member of the historic committee, um, commission, it, it is a challenge. But it's one of those situations where we're facing an economic struggle because this is not one of the wealthiest parishes in our, in our city. Um, but at the same time, really wanting to sustain and, and to foster the development of, of uh, the parish life, if you will. Um, it's, it's, the church itself is, is a critical element in, in Craddock as a, as a community uh, uh, place of, of gathering and worship. And um, the, the challenge that we've been given from the diocese in Richmond is that uh, they're unable to invest more money to do all the work that needs to be done. So we're looking at the money that's available and its application in the sanctuary, which requires a, a fairly extensive roof repair. There's extensive damage on the interior with the plaster wall. There's, there's extensive damage in terms of the gutters and downspouts. Um, and all of that, and, and the stained glass windows, which are fast deteriorating because of water infiltration. So it's either putting the money and applying it there for the people to use, or investing in the bell tower, which breaks my heart, but as an option to truncate it and lower the tower and, and create, um, make it function as a transition space between the sanctuary and the fellowship hall. So in essence, that's, that's the dilemma that we have. And so in asking you to, to reverse the commission's um, denial, uh, I'm speaking for the parishioners. It's, it's their heart to, to be able to be in that church and use it um, for the life of the community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Whitaker. Uh, yes. Is, is the uh, Most Reverend Walter Sullivan present? No, no. Okay. Um, the, uh, the, the pastor of, of that church is Father Anthony Morris. Okay, is, is Father Morris present? Yes. Mr. Mayor, is it okay if uh, Father Morris approached the mic? Um, again, this is not a public hearing. Um, what's the nature of the question? Well, I want to, well, let me, let me direct the question to the city attorney. Okay. Um, should we be advised on um, whether uh, preserving historical value in the city uh, versus religious expression, um, should we be advised on uh, the legality of that before we act on this issue? Because since it is a church involved, Mr. City Attorney. Dr. Whitaker, if I understand your question correctly, um, the, the issue before this particular body um, is one um, that is equivalent across the board in terms of the, the hist historic nature. There is no religious purpose, I believe, that uh, that would put this in a different standing. I think this is to be treated as a home would be. I don't, uh, uh, if I'm answering your question, I don't think there's a uh, distinction to be made for that particular purpose. I, I know you don't like giving um, legal opinions uh, without research. Is that something that you can bring back to us um, whether there is an issue of religious expression uh, here that we should uh, be advised on before we vote on an issue such as this. Um, I understand the historical value, but there, there are also some uh, concerns given that this is a religious organization in church and state. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. Um, Councilwoman Simmons. Well, Mr. Mayor, before that, um, if there's no objection from council, I would think we would want to be advised from the city attorney on this issue since it does involve church and state and we. we I wanted want to speak to this issue. Rights. All right. Um, what did you say? I said I wanted to speak to the issue you raised. Oh, yeah. All right. Hold on, folks. In addition to the motion to uphold or to deny, the chair would also consider a motion to table for a particular purpose. So if your motion, uh, Dr. Whitaker, is to table pending an opinion from the city attorney on your question, that would be an appropriate motion. Okay. Right. But we're not ready for a motion. Let's, and we're not in our discussion. Do you have a question for the, the speaker? Uh, no, my question is to the city attorney also. Okay, let's, let's hold that. Okay. Let's make sure we get all of our questions to the speaker. Uh, Council, Councilman Moody. Your light went Mayor, off. Mayor, my question wasn't to the speaker okay. uh, either. So, All right, do, do we have any other questions to the speaker? All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Ah. Councilman Clark. Thank you for your patience. This is the first time this new council's had a historic preservation commission consideration. Sir, I just had a question for you. I was sitting here looking at looking at the photographs of where the, the tower currently is now and the way you wish to truncate it. I guess my question is 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 it in is it a hazard at this time? Is it in danger of falling or what is that situation? It's fast becoming a hazard. Um, there's been enough water infiltration that uh, during the winter with the freezing and thawing of, of uh, in the mortar joints, there's been expansion of those joints. So, um, and also the copper roof on top, at the very top, is leaking. There's infiltration through the, the, uh, the bell tower vents. Um, so the plaster on the inside has totally fallen off. Um, and. Uh, it needs to be addressed one way or another. Otherwise, it will become a major structural issue. And that, that was my question, because it, it appears that the intent is to truncate it down and to put a hip roof on it. Correct. And that's why I was just curious if, you know, if it was in danger of falling, if it's a danger at this point, or if, you know, possibly a hip roof could be put on in its current condition, would it have the same results as far as the safety and what's going on with your tower? It will take more than a roof because the, uh, the intermediate floors, one of them has totally collapsed. Okay. Uh, there's only uh, the second floor and there's an intermediate floor that's collapsed and then the floor where the bell actually exists is located. And so, um, it's sort of a, as a diaphragm, because that's, that floor is no longer there, then the tendency is for the masonry to move because it was acting as a brace, if you will. And um, to, you can't kind of do a patch. <laughs> it has to be fixed. Uh, we can't afford to fix it. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, my colleagues, any other questions for the applicant? All right, the chair will entertain a motion. And again, the motion could be, uh, oh, you still have your question. Mm -hmm. The chair won't entertain a mm -hmm. motion. Well, let's, I tell you what, in order for us to discuss this, we need a motion so we can get it on the table. And so. Well, then I'll make a motion to affirm the decision of the Historic Preservation Commission. Is there a second? There's no second. Is there another motion? I move, Mayor, I move that we deny the HBC's decision. The nature of your, that you overrule their decision? We overrule their decision. Is there a second to that motion? That motion does not have a second. Dr. Whitaker, you're, do you have a motion? Let me, let me make sure that um, 
that my colleagues are clear on what, what they're voting on. Um, Councilman Moody just made a motion to deny um, the, the motion to uh, deny um, and the motion to table. Um, our colleagues are aware that um, by tabling it, it will come back. By denying it, it will not come back. That is correct. Um, a motion to table would uh, table it to the next meeting. And if it's incorporated into the motion, uh, a direction to the city attorney to do whatever research is necessary for council to consider this matter in two weeks. So again, to review what appears to the chair to be the appropriate motions, a motion to either agree with the uh, action of the Historic Preservation Commission or disagree, which is to overrule them, or to table it uh, so that the city attorney can address the question that was raised by Dr. Whitaker. Well, not, not yet. I just, before, before I make that motion, if necessary, uh, I think council should hear from uh, Father Sullivan. I know in the past we have heard from multiple persons representing an entity. It's, it's a question that I would like to ask that would clarify the direction of the motion. Okay. If uh, there's no objection from council. Let me poll council. Does anybody on council have any disagreement with allowing uh, the clergy to approach the lectern and address council? Fine. No. Okay. So, sir, if you would come forward, and Dr. Whitaker has a question uh, for you. Yes, Father Sullivan. Uh, no, it's uh, Father Morris. Bishop Sullivan was the. Um, Bishop at the time okay. of uh, the renovations of the church, and, okay, I'm and I'm the pastor now. Okay, Father Morris. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Father Morris, as far as the uh, bell tower was concerned, uh, how is the bell tower used? It's not used at all. It's closed off, and um, right now we have two by fours holding up the uh, second floor from collapsing. It's closed off because of safety issues. Um, I've only been pastor for about a year and a half. This has been a long-term issue that has not been addressed, and it's one of my four parishes, and what I'm trying to do is, as uh, the ar our architect said, is my primary focus is to get the worship space functioning and safe, and so that it doesn't deteriorate any further without having to sing a large amount of money into the bell tower. Um, so I want the bell tower safe, but I don't want to put what little funds we have um, uh, and the diocese requires me to have so much money raised and I can only borrow so much money. Okay. And the money has to be come from the parish itself. Okay, so does the, <clears throat> does truncating the bell tower, will that help to promote a safe environment for worship? Absolutely, yes, sir. Um, it, we, we would eliminate the interior, put the bell on the lawn. Uh, we would no longer have a bell in the tower. Uh, and truncating it would allow us to, um, uh, the bottom of the bell tower is a hallway. It connects the worship space to the hall, so that we'd still have that function. It would still look as part of the building. It just wouldn't be a bell tower any longer. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Councilwoman Lucas Burke. Okay. okay I guess uh, my question. Um, I see that it's going to be fifty to seventy thousand dollars to. Uh, repair the tower, but what is the difference in cost to truncate? Is the, uh, would the, uh, architect, would the architect come back? The fifty to 70000 to fix the tower um, was an estimate that was done several years ago. Mm -hmm. In the bid climate today, it was it's closer to $150,000. That's the latest number we have, which we got earlier this, this year. So it's ex that's, that is absolutely prohibitive for us. Right. Is there is. any cost associated? What is the truncating cost? The truncating, we would have to essentially deconstruct 
the tower. Okay. Um, and the estimate is between fifty and sixty thousand dollars to take it down. So it's it's the way it's cost. It's co it's cost and, and with the bid climate today it's it's the number keeps going up, not down. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Okay. All right, any other questions from council to the applicant? Dr. Whitaker. Uh, it's not a question, but I would let, let Councilman Moody know that if he wants to present that motion again based on what Father, Sol Father Morris has indicated, I would second it. <laughs> okay. All right. What so is moved. Your motion is to overrule, overrule the, the HPC's yeah. okay. decision. Yeah. Second. We, okay. We have a motion to overrule the action of the Historic Preservation Commission. It's been seconded. It's ready for our discussion. Councilwoman Simmons. Yes, sir, thank you. Um, you know, in my time on council, I have watched um, several churches in historic districts go through similar issues. Monumental churches in downtown has rebuilt their steeple. St. Paul's Catholic Church has had a tremendous renovation and rebuild to their steeple. My own church, Trinity Church, which is older than the city of Portsmouth, had a bell tower issue that turned into an entire new slate roof on a building that is more than 250 years old. Um, you know, th this is unfortunately what happens to old buildings and in historic districts. And I realize this church is not historic in itself. It sits in a historic district. but. I don't know how we can hold one set of buildings to a standard and, and not all. You know, there is time. There is time to fundraise. There's time to to make it right and make it stay in the architectural series that it started in. And I, and I would bet the architect, if he was sitting on the other side of the fence where he used to sit on HPC, would have joined his colleagues on HPC in denial. So I will vote to sustain the uh, actions of HPC. All right. Any other? Okay, Dr. Whitaker. I, I just wanted to make sure I was clear on what Councilwoman Simmons said. The church is not historic. Correct. The okay. location. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Any other discussions? Are you right. ready for? So uh, my second still stands in support of the motion. Okay. Any other discussion? Are you ready for the question? The motion is to overturn the action of the HPC. If you're in favor of that, vote yes. If you're not, vote no. Motion carries. And ladies and gentlemen, this concludes this, the portion that we'll conduct here in the council chamber. We'll take a brief recess as council travels from here to the council confer, conference room. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council, let's reconvene at 632. We'll come back in this session. And we're reconvening, and we're at item number two, uh, the new Portside Review. I'm going to introduce. Oh. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of City Council, this evening we have presentations encompassing areas relating to continuing efforts toward achieving City Council's vision and goals set during the City Council retreat. The discussion of Tell the Portsmouth Story centered around rebuilding Portside a place where people gather to enjoy waterfront events and activities. Approved in the FY 2018 CIP budget is 731,000 with an additional securing of a grant from the Port of Virginia of 109,650 for funding for this project. This evening, Mr. James Wright, city engineer, will share the proposed plans for the new port sign. The city's current parking regulations have impact on property owners and developers going through the zoning compliance permit 
or site plan approval processes. Parking standards will pre be presented tonight. Current regulations can be detriment to new development and redevelopment in the city. As a result, staff in conjunction with VHB consultants have spent several months reviewing and preparing suggest suggested revisions to address the stated issues. Planning Director Mr. Bob Baldwin will provide an update on the process used to develop proposed zoning ordinance changes as well as current schedule to process the required zoning amendments to incorporate recommended changes. The City of Portsmouth is a self-insured city for most risks, however the city does purchase insurance for property liability and other areas to lower the city's risk exposures. Mr. Brian Parker, the city's risk manager, will review the FY 2018 insurance coverages for the city. Mr. Parker joined the city staff four months ago, having served as risk manager for the County of Henrico and Henrico Public Schools and the city of Norfolk. While the city is self-insured for most risks, the city does purchase insurance for property and liability and other areas to lower our risk exposures. Mr. Parker will be reviewing the FY 2018 insurance coverages for the city. We will begin with Mr. Wright. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, member of the City Council. Here to present um, the Newport side. The Newport side in downtown Portsmouth will create a new meeting place at a familiar location for residents and visitors. This project fulfills the City Council vision for the use of its waterfront. Portside is a half acre site adjacent to Bill Deal Street across from the North Inlet. The North Inlet includes the water stage and the ferry landing. It also sits in close proximity to the Visitor Center, Harbor Tower Apartments, Harbor Garage, and a Renaissance Hotel. Old Town is on the other side of Crawford Street. Here is a rendering of what Port Side could look like. Um, the new Port Side will consist of a 5,000 square foot pavilion and its associated site improvements. The pavilion will be open air with a sloped standing seam metal roof. Under the roof there will be enclosed vendor food preparation spaces with serving counters and an enclosed utility space totaling 1,000 square feet. The bathrooms are also included. The remainder of the pavilion the remainder of the pavilion will be assembly and circulation space suitable for tables and chairs. There's also planned a small stage area for musical acts. The layout of the site will allow for city-sponsored events, outdoor dining, festivals, and private parties. The vendor spaces will be rented to local food vendors on a seasonal basis. Concept of Portside began uh, in FY 2016. The preliminary site design is based on vendor, vendor space for three to four vendors, assuming that all vendors will have the same basic requirements for food service and beverage sales. The design plans are currently at 30%. The estimated cost of those plans is $731,000. The city submitted a grant application to the Port of Virginia for the aid of local port grant in FY 2017 and FY 2018. A grant award of $109,650 was approved for FY 2018. The acceptance and appropriation of funds for this grant is on your agenda for tomorrow night. So we're at a point where uh, we need some decisions made. And since staff has no local restaurant experience, we reached out to local restaurateurs to get industry input about the space and what type of venue might work best in today's climate. The Department of Economic Development made the initial contact with seven individuals. We were able to talk with five of those seven. In general, they were consistent in the needs for the vending space. However, the vision of what the venue might look like varied among the group. They were consistent in that it should be family friendly, should not attempt, should not attempt to duplicate Waterside, and the terms for commercial leases will be very important. Other considerations that they brought to, to our attention were that the lead times on some of the kitchen specialty items um, could be an issue uh, as far as timing and, and getting construction done. ABC approval and final layout uh, considerations will sort of go hand in hand so that will affect who comes to vend and what type of people you get to vend and then what role will food trucks play in the site. 
So we're at the point where we're looking for some input from city council. So our next steps is to come to city council and get some input on, on, on these items. Uh, we'll move forward with the design, with the finish, with the intent to finish design and have all our required reviews done in November. And as you can see there, uh, our schedule puts our completion sometime in June. Um, the RFQ for vendors will happen the first part of the year with selection towards the end of February. Um, that'll allow time for vendors to see the plan and to see, to see the design and plan for their space requirements, but also allows them to take part in the marketing campaign. Um, so with that, I have questions. So the things that we're looking for city council from is three to four vendors. Um, what type of role do you want food trucks to play? Um, those, those key questions right there. Dr. Pat. Dr. Whitaker. Yes. Yes, sir. I have a question. The um, the total cost, I see the design plan is $731,000, um, and I know we got the grant. And so how much of taxpayer money are we looking to invest in this? You're looking at the the total of 731 and the 109050 We're looking at that amount. Um, for this project. But, but I mean, I'll, well, the grant. Well, the city has already approved the CIP, right. so that's 731000 Well, I mean, well, the source of those funds, 731000 <coughs> is coming from where? CIP. You all approved it in the budget. Right, so that's what's, those are tax dollars. Yes, they yeah, are. so that's, the grant is only how much? 109630 something. Right, dollars. And, and the 731 is, that's just the design phase? That's based on a 30% estimate of what construction what could potentially cost. Right, okay. and construction, okay. design and construction. Okay. My question, um, the three to four vendors is going to be seasonal, so when the season go out? Um, when the season goes out, it, it'll, it'll be closed for the, for the winter. Similar to the former port side, it open late spring, um, close sometime in the fall. Okay, and, and signage, I know that signage is an issue, so. That would, so. That would be part of the plan. The, the design uh, came from, is this just a... It was, it was conceptual staff working to see what the former port site was, what would be a, a little bit more of a high-end concept. Um, so we had input from several departments and we got to the 30% design stage and prior to moving forward, we talked to local restaurant owners and then come back to city council for some additional input. So have we looked at some other uh, similar structures uh, on the scale. That was that was part of the original design. Yes. Okay. Bear, I would like to say to council that the design and this concept um, started before I came in September first of 2015. When I came here, the past council had already started and had had um, put forward a conceptualization of what they would like portside to look like. So this is a continuation of back in 2015 when this discussion with council started. So as far as the RFP that will be uh, put out, is that RFP going to be based off of a pre-design or will those uh, contractors come up with uh, a design? No, the invitation to bid will be based on the final, the final plans and so we'll take what information we receive from City Council and as we go through the design process, when we get to that point, we're planning that 100%, then we'll go out for bid. And um, also, as far as, far as the um, study that was done, um, so you, you know, the staff contacted uh, seven local vendors and got their input? We attempted to contact seven. We were only successful in reaching, it, reaching five of the seven. Okay, so you're, you're comfortable with those persons being experts at telling the city staff about what design will work and what will work at Portside versus having done um, an actual study to even see if the project is feasible on the property. Uh, Ms. Dr. Whitaker, the, um, the contact that was made with the restauranteurs was soliciting their input on as a restauranteur presently 
if in fact whatever kind of restaurant, what is it that they think would be needed in the vendor space? The restauranteurs were not, uh, they were dealing with the, the vendor space, those on, on the design. You could see where there would be the five vending spaces. If I'm going to have a restaurant, what would I need to have in my vending space? What kind of size would I need? But they were not advising on the design of it. They so, were just dealing with the vendor so, space. So you don't think it would be more feasible to get some type of input from uh, a study that looks at what has been successful, these type of projects that have been successful nationwide well, the, to set up. The city um, had a successful port side that existed from 86 up until late 90s or 90s. And, and, and that was um, hosted, designed by the team pretty much who was here in public uh, properties management. But if I remember correct, I, 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 mean, I thought that was a more like a tent set up. If I, well, it, that, that wasn't putting an actual physical structure. And that physical, I, don't think, I don't think that um, incurred the type of cost we're talking about. I'll be, I don't know what the cost was then, but it was a, a it, it started as a tent structure, but it was a permanent structure there for 15 years or a long period of time, although it was a tent. Those those design spaces for the vendors, and I think they probably had about 10 vendors in the the, the design of that. I just I, I just think if, if, you, if we're going to be committing these type of funds, we, we ought to at least have some more sound basis than just speaking to five restaurant owners. That's, uh, that's just my concern. I think we've had a, we've listened to lots of experts who asked for this for the last many, many years in our citizens. Um, and frankly, the, a lot of the conversation for this that started in 2014 and 15, I can see Mayor Wright and I standing on that location at a Chamber of Commerce event or something saying, why do we not have this here? I don't need a study to know it's what people want. Okay. Bill. <laughs> I don't think it's a study, but I, I do agree that uh, we, we might uh, ask and, and look at some other people on the design of the, of the uh, vendor portion of it, because I think that's going to be extremely important to be able to attract or, or to have concession heirs, because this is more of a concession right. facility, right, uh, to be able to attract them, uh, I think you've got to have a facility that's going to fit their needs. Uh, there again, I don't think we need a $50,000 study to do that. Uh, probably just uh, can, can look around the region or uh, within the state uh, to get some ideas. So. But. I mean, I, I think it's a, a, a good idea. I mean, I, I want it to be more than just a food truck or a hot dog stand. You know, I want it to be, you know, something great. I don't know, you know, what the restauranteurs, you know, gave you as options of what they want to see, you know, in there. You know, if it's going to be seasonal, you know, people like barbecue and beer and, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Um, you know, so we want to stay in line with what the season is going to, you know, call for people wanting oysters or whatever it is. Okay. Yeah, the only, only question I had is, you know, speaking about these for vendors, since it is seasonal and it's potential that the vendors change annually, mm -hmm. is, you know, certain things, you know, range hoods and the stainless steel sinks that are required by the health department, you know, thinking about is there a way that we could have somewhat modular in there to where it can be changed slightly for different vendors? because they might have, you know, some, one might use a fryer, mm -hmm. one might not, mm -hmm. but we need to have it, you know, if it's just straight up very simple, it's going to limit their equipment. So I was wondering if there was a possibility of it, you know, like I said, being modular, you know, having, you know, certain kind of electrical plugs for certain equipment, oh. having gas, and that way it can be slight changes done on an annual basis to meet the requirements of the vendors since it's not going to be the same vendors permanently. So I think it would benefit us to have that option. Well, the, the, that, that brings up a point. Uh, who is going to equip it? Is it going to be the city? Is it going to be the vendors? Obviously, you've you got to have the electrical uh, uh, capacity as well as the plumbing. And, and uh, 
uh, the hood system. I take it that since they're going to have 100 days to do business, basically, uh, that the city is going to equip the facility. Paige had his hand up. Paige. Well, I like to answer to hear that question. He just asked about the, who's going to equip it. But the other thing, can, can you um, build some flexibility into the request? Yes, um, there's pretty much standard equipment across the board that all the all the vendors mentioned as far as things you needed for Department of Health, things you needed for different types of food that you First would serve. Was, who, who's going to put the bill? We, we, know, we know it's got you know, you're going to have so many outlets, so much, so, so, so much kind of power, water. We know you got to have all that stuff. Are we supplying all, all of that? In our last port site, it was supplied by those who were the vendors. Okay. The city did not buy the equipment for port site and for probably about uh, two years under two years under Parks and Recreation, I managed. Then properties management came up. So the the equipment were those who were um, had the contracts to operate their businesses there. Right. So that the answer that one. Right. So, so can we build some flexibility into the request that will allow for something that doesn't look, may, it may not look exactly like exactly like this, but but still fits the bill and doesn't doesn't um, break the bank. Right. Yeah. This is early enough. That's why we come to you to get that type of input. So we're still early enough in the process that things can be modified taken out, added in, and so this is the point where we would come to you to get answers to some of those questions. So Dr. one request that um, has come forward is that um, there were um, seven uh, vendors attempted, five were able to be interviewed, but to solicit some more restaurant tour uh, opinions, probably around the region, and um, uh, look at uh, modulo for possibility for different uh, vendors. So we will take this and then continue to work and come back and give you an update. I, I thought I heard too about <clears throat> about the design of it that there would be some type of um, consideration of other designs around the around the state area. I thought that's what was mentioned. Well, I think Councilman Moody brought that up. Look, look at. Have you looked at other facilities right. in the state? So this is some more we, looked, we looked at uh, in the region, not necessarily in the state, but in the region we did. All right. So so this design is more consistent with um, the designs you've seen around the state? Is that what you're saying? I actually think the rendering is from a facility in Suffolk, I think. <laughs> I'm trying to think where I've seen this at now. It, yeah, it is in Suffolk, right, right off of, okay. yeah. yeah. This was designed for the farmer's market. market. Yeah. 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 Any other comments? To sum up the conversation, I think it's the consensus of the majority of council that we don't need to do a market study. That this uh, um, is not a market study request that continue to move forward, take into consideration the things that have been said. Mm -hmm. And I would add, report back uh, quickly. Don't don't wait until you're 70 percent. Come back mm -hmm. at 45 percent. Right. We'll be providing you updates so that you're ready. Is that everything? Agreed? Yes. That's agreed. Okay. All right. Mr. Um, Baldwin will present the planning standards. Good evening, Mayor Rowe, uh, Vice Mayor Cherry, and members of City Council. We're continuing to uh, um, update City Council on the progress being made, uh, updating and revising the city's parking regulations. Oops. All right, Deborah. Here we go. Yeah, I'm good here. Are you good? Yeah, I'm good here. Yep. Okay. So uh, we've mentioned we've had a couple of. Uh, uh, prior discussions on parking. This goes back to a period of time where um, um, we were taking a look at the parking prior to the current process of updating the entire zoning regulations. And um, so um, 
if you go back to the very beginning of this process, which we've been working at it for about six months, we started off, you know, why is the ordinance being revised? And so, uh, number one, of course, we have the D2 district. We've mentioned before our zoning ordinances in multiple books. We're trying to combine all of the regulations into one document, into one location. Uh, we want to make revisions based on our experiences in applying the regulations, and we were running into a number of issues where we were having trouble getting site plans approved, having trouble getting zoning clearances uh, issued, and we had a number of processes built into that which seemed to be overly bureaucratic without a whole lot of value in terms of uh, what was being accomplished through that. Uh, we also want to benchmark. One of the things we typically like to do, take a look at the rest of Hampton Road, see how our parking standards look when you compare them with other localities. And right now there's a lot of movement going on in the zoning world with regard to parking, so we want to take a look at that. And the other one, and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but to increase, we'll go increase flexibility in our, in our parking decisions. <clears throat> As we've discussed uh, a few times before, one of the issues we've had here was the, uh, the former Type 2 site plan process. That used to be the primary process by which parking requirements were modified or layout requirements were modified. And I believe we stopped using that somewhere around 2014, 2015 after a Virginia Supreme Court case. Um, uh, strangely, our parking requirement section of the current zoning ordinance does not allow anyone to request a variance. Uh, it's one of the more odd things you see in a zoning code to preclude someone's right to, a, to an appeal. Um, currently does not allow that. And we also had the, you know, the, the, the uh, beginning in 2010 of the minimum and maximum parking. So you'd have projects from which we'd set the minimum, which has normally been the process in zoning, but our code currently has a cap. And so there's a maximum set. We've had a number of people run up against the cap and cause problems getting approved. I just mentioned a few of them, a Chick-fil-A, uh, Aldi's, um, and we go through a number of processes, some of these sort of bureaucratic processes. We just didn't seem to be a whole lot of value in, in the uh, maximum cap. So, um, but anyway, that was one of the concerns that have been raised multiple times, and some of this by at the staff level, many times also by the development community, saying, what, you know, what, what's up with this thing? And we've still got others that are still out there. So we go back to the goals. You know, we started working on the parking requirements. We wanted to streamline our requirements. Uh, we wanted to. At the time we started, I'm going to go back, you know, six months ago, we wanted to change those minimum maximum numbers. In some cases we thought the minimums were too high. And again, sometimes we thought those maximums were just an unnecessary, unreasonable cap. Uh, we had a, a, a number of issues with the bike standards, way too many bike parking requirements. I believe at the Kroger site, I think it required 100 bike parking spaces, something along those names. Just some stuff that's just kind of out of line. And then we wanted to go back in this, having a process for developers or property owners uh, to request modifications without telling them there's simply no process for you. Um, I'll just tell you phil philosophically, we don't like the staff to be the uh, dead end in a process. There should always be some sort of an appeal and it shouldn't end at the staff level. So we try to build that, make sure we have it. That's generally applied in the code. The parking is just, it's just not there. So as Dr. Patton uh, mentioned at the beginning, we work with the consultant team of VHB. They're um, a, uh, a national firm. They have a lot of uh, resources within their firm. They, they can look at, at um, what's going on nationally. They do a lot of site plan work, a lot of commercial work. Um, so they put together a really strong team to assist us in t kind of taking a look at what we were trying to do with revising our codes and whether we, in some cases, we're getting too low, we're getting too high, helping us sort of balance out some of the standards is we did a page by page, item by item reassessment of our parking. And the primary city staff, and I'm only listing the primary up here, planning, engineering, and the city attorney. There's a lot of work uh, by these three departments, but we also had others um, uh, take a look at it, uh, and give us their feedback, economic development, for example. So we started our process with VHB. We had some stakeholders, some local developers we talked to, get some of their feedback, what their experience has been like. Um, good or bad. Again, we did our benchmarking, looking at other localities. Uh, then we did this fine tuning, working with VHB, looking at what sort of national experiences are. And then we went through multiple drafts, trying to keep working on the issues until we got as close as we could get to, uh, to addressing all of those issues we started with. So I'm going to summarize. This is a, kind of a quick summary, but uh, what you, you have, and if, if you look in the zoning ordinance, you'll see we have a parking table tells you how much parking is generated by each use. We went through each and every one of those and fine-tuned, updated, modified uh, all the parking requirements. We have removed that parking maximum requirement. So that process that was in there that set that 
sort of artificial cap in there has been uh, proposed for elimination. We have, again, we've created an appeals process, and there's actually two that we're going to be proposing. One is a regular appeal, go to the Board of Zone Appeals, you have an odd shaped parcel, uh, some other physical reason you can't do it. The other we're talking about, um, we run into an occasion, of course, it being a, um, a mostly built out city, a lot of non conforming parcels. We get into to, uh, non conforming lots and things, and so we're looking at the concept of a special exception for helping us deal with these non conformities. Uh, we, we did a major modification of the parking requirements, and then we did that consolidation of putting all the parking requirements into uh, one <coughs> section. And I'll just mention one thing. Uh, when we did all that, we probably shortened the parking uh, section of zoning code prob by probably 10 pages. I mean, it's much shorter. It's much simpler. Um, I'll mention right now the, uh, the draft is posted on the Planning Department's webpage if anybody wants to go and look at the draft parking regulations. We also posted the current ones. So if you want to compare old versus new, those are both on, the, on our web page. Um, if city council's satisfied with where we are at this point, our plan would be to go to the planning commission at their meeting on August the 1st and kind of give them a more detailed uh, briefing on what's in the proposed changes. And then we would schedule that for public hearing in September and bring it to city council for adoption in October. So sort of in a nutshell, there's a lot of work that has gone into this, but this is trying to get us back to something we think is going to be much more um, user friendly. And I think, in fact, uh, takes advantage of, of better th thinking in terms of parking. I'll just give an example. We've talked about one of these before. Uh, we have some of these larger industrial buildings, um, old buildings, and, and our current parking requirements are based on square footage of the building. So you might have a very large industrial building. You might have 10 people working in it. And the, and the ordinance didn't give you any options. It said, okay, give us 100 and, you know, 120 parking spaces when you needed 10. So under the, under the uh, proposed change, you'd have the option of basing it off your largest shift. So a developer comes in. One of the changes I just mentioned in terms of the zoning world is really working more with developers and trying to you tell us really what your needs are. And, and we know that a lot of these companies have a much better handle on what their parking requirements are than any sort of generic zoning ordinance might have. And so we try to, and I'll just mention all those Aldi's, they could come in and tell you, like, we need one more space or two more spaces to kind of meet their quick turnover grocery store model, which, you know, our zoning ordinance didn't have anything like that in it. So we try to work very closely to match up with some of those things and, and to lower, again, lower that minimum standard and then allowing the developers to kind of raise up a little bit if it meets their particular um, demand. I'll give you one other one that you might find interesting. It's something like a Waffle House. You might think small building. You know, how much, how much parking would a Waffle House need? But, you know, you have a small building that seats 50 people. They've got staff. They've got, you know, six uh, chairs for a waiting. Um, they have a very high demand for parking in a Waffle House, but our parking regulations had that cap on it. Just jammed them right off the top. They couldn't get through our site plan process. So these are the kind of things we listened to and have tried to um, adjust in, in, in the proposed changes. So uh, with that, I'd be glad to take any uh, questions or comments or suggestions. Yeah. This is a question. How will these uh, changes impact on uh, houses of worship uh, parking requirements? Okay, well, uh, we've made a few modifications in that. Most likely, the uh, and I don't have that specific one. I'll certainly get that direct for you, but most likely it's lowered the minimum requirement. Um, we've changed in some of the way the, the calculations are done, but again, without a maximum on it. So um, uh, any type of an, of, a, of an institution similar to that, religious institution in particular, um, we looked at schools and universities and, and those types of things. Um, there's a different, a different uh, ca um, calculation that, again, lowers the minimum but allows them to address based on how they operate. We, all, we know a lot of these users, each one is a different operation and having a, a fixed, um, capped, Kind of a parking standard tends to run people again up into that into that maximum. So, um, can my you, can you get the we certainly get you the details for it. Okay. okay. But we've lowered most of those standards in, in, in those cases. Can you get it tomorrow since we're meeting tomorrow. Will you have that? Certainly. Too, so, okay. Certainly. Thank you. Yeah, we, can you do that? Yes, we should have it tomorrow. Can you have it by tomorrow? I can have it probably tonight. Very good. Certainly by tomorrow. Uh, how would it impact no. something like uh, Walmart? Uh, and the reason why I ask, I know when our Walmart opened, there, there was so much parking space that uh, we had rodeos and different things there, and, that, and now people have built in the 
Right, well, I think a couple of things have happened since Walmart, and that's, that's a great point because the Walmarts of the world are what drove a lot of people. The two things that drove most localities have too much parking were, were the original concept of Black Friday and Walmart. And as you can imagine, you know, if you're trying to provide parking for Black Friday at one day out of the year, I need 500 spaces. Every other day, I need 100. Well, the city is going to make you build a 500 space parking lot to accommodate that day. Well, obviously, the Black Friday shopping experience has changed. Um, most people also recognize you're just not going to design your code for that one day event. Right. And you have to have something that's more of a day thing. Walmart, for those people, you know, and I'm not sure their current philosophy is, but their old philosophy was we like to overbuild the parking so we don't look like we're too busy, so people be encouraged to come in. And so they like to have extra space. You've noticed, for example, the one we have, they've been selling off their parking lot because even they've recognized that's not a good business model. And so they've been lowering their standards down. There's also, um, and I don't get too much into the press now, but we do have stormwater requirements now that people have to pay for all that impervious surface. So there's also a financial incentive to not overbuild unnecessary parking. And we're certainly trying to accommodate people to not overbuild. We don't force them to overbuild. We also want to cap somebody who needs a few extra. Okay. Few extra space. Yeah. Lisa was first, and then you. Okay. How? Uh, what kind of consideration did you take with the uh, modified bike parking? I mean, was that the number of business license? I mean, bike licenses. No, I'll give you a few a few examples we did with the bike parking. Let's take, for example, a um, an apartment complex. And our old code did not take into consideration you might actually take your bike into your oh. apartment with you. Mm -hmm. And anybody has a relatively expensive bike knows you don't leave your bike outside in one of those environments. So we wanted to give credit for those for those kind of places. Um, places having garages, and I'll just mention one like some Dan Aston might build his apartment where he's got a, a garage. We give we were giving no credit for garages for putting a bike in there. You get no credit for that. So we've lowered a lot of those. Some of those we just changed we just lowered the numbers. We just recognize mentioned the, the Kroger. The odds you need a hundred bicycles at a Kroger well, well a great thought if you're in Norway or somewhere, for example, you know, not going to happen at our Kroger right off the bat. So you want to get that down to what's reasonable. For, we do have a fair number of people ride bikes in town. We're trying to accommodate the right amount. We're just not trying to. Mm -hmm. A couple other things we did. We did raise the um, status of bike parking. For example, I just mentioned again with apartments. Um, we want you to put your bike rack, if you're putting in a bike rack, mm -hmm. as close as your closest car parking space mm -hmm. so that we, we raise the, the bicycle parking from a physical layout standpoint to the same kind of level. We don't treat the bike like stick it in the back where no one would ever want to park. So, so those are some of the, there's a number of, of those changes. And they went by each different type of use. We did another thing in these parking standards with bikes. We separated bike parking into uh, what we call more uh, long-term bike parking. There's a standard like if it's your apartment, mm -hmm. your bike, that's a long-term parking requirement. And then there's a, a parking requirement for short-term, which would be visitors. So we've lowered that visitor standard, given more credit for the um, um, long-term parking. And, and overall, uh, I think we've, we've properly accommodated. We'll keep you know um, evaluating that over time, but I think we've gotten the parking much closer to the actual Part, you know, probably a little bit greater than the actual demand starting off, but assume we have more and more people uh, riding bikes to make sure we accommodate that. All right. Questions? Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Unrelated to your study, but parking makes me think of it. On the west side of Court Street, opposite the public library, there are at least a half a dozen parking meters that are all bound up in duct tape. Uh, clearly, they're not being used. They look atrocious. Where? On Court the Street. block of Court Street where the public library is. So the west side. The west side of Court, between County and King. Yeah, I don't know why. We took a lot of meters down there when we redid the, uh, the underground utilities and repaved, but the there are still meters down closer to in front of uh, Guad's restaurant. And they're all bound up with duct tape. We'll they look, look at it. We, we will look into it, Councilwoman, and get an answer back to you. I saw it the other channel. night, and I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't, I can't. It answer. looks ridiculous. Okay. Anyway, mm -hmm. sorry. Just okay. maybe think of it. Okay. We don't need any more of those. No. <laughs> any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, Mayor, our last presentation tonight is uh, Mr. Uh, Brian Parker. Mr. Parker. I'll look at it. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Mayor Rowe, Vice Mayor Terry, members of City Council, Madam City Manager, good evening. It's a pleasure to come before you tonight to review the FY18 insurance coverages for the city. Um, but before I get started, I'd like to introduce Mr. Tom Heim. He's the Senior Vice President with Wells Fargo for Insurance Services. Um, Wells Fargo is the insurance broker for the city and schools. Uh, we have a mutual contract with schools um, for brokerage services. Um, I, I'll explain a little bit more in my presentation on the services that uh, Wells Fargo provides to the city. Risk management is responsible for identifying potential risks to, to the safety, security, and financials of the city and determine which of those risks should be transferred to an insurance company and which ones we want to self-insure. Some of the services risk management provides are analyzing and managing the city's insurance and risk exposures, review of city contracts, insurance certificate review and issuance, management of the city's safety program, review of special events for risk exposures, and oversight of claims management for property and liability claims. Local governments hire third party consultants or insurance brokers who work on the city's behalf at the direction of risk management to purchase insurance coverages as needed. Insurance brokers provide a wide, a wide array of services including negotiating and purchasing insurance coverages, providing loss analysis reports, identifying exposures, claims auditing and program analytics, loss forecasting and accrual analysis, risk retention, and property valuations. Insurance brokers also evaluate risk management programs to determine their effectiveness and program recommendations regarding potential risk exposures. For FY18, the city has seen substantial savings in our insurance program. The property insurance premium had a reduction of $137,452. Our liability insurance premium had a slight increase of $29,255 due to current risk exposures. Excess workers' comp coverage had a reduction in premium of $41,057. Workers' comp claims costs had a reduction of $410,468 from fiscal year 17 from fiscal year 16 to fiscal year 17, which is a great accomplishment in the management of the claims. Um, I think it's also important to note that in fiscal year 14, claims cost was a million two hundred thousand, and fiscal year 15, claims cost was a million two hundred eighty-eight thousand. This past fiscal year, claims cost was down to four hundred eighty-three thousand. So there's, a, there's definitely a significant savings there um, in the management of that program. Um, network and uh, cyber security had a very slight reduction from 27,000 to 200, I mean to 26,988 dollars. I'm very pleased to announce a total savings of 154,219 dollars in insurance premium for fiscal year 18. Also, our property insurance coverage has a guarantee rate for the next two years, so that 137,452 dollars in premium savings is guaranteed for the next two years. In this slide, I'd like to show a few significant changes in our insurance coverage with no added cost. Our flood coverage increased from $10 million to $50 million in coverage. Our earthquake coverage increased from $10 million to $50 million. Our building ordinance coverage increased from $1 million to $10 million. And our cyber liability coverage increased from $3 million to $5 million. These were very significant changes to our insurance program and transfers additional risks from the city to the insurance carriers. In an effort to further mitigate risk, risk management is implementing a comprehensive safety program. Some aspects of this program we will be implementing are formal safety audits of departments, inspection of work zones and operations, updating and developing safety policies, introducing an online safety training system, forming safety committees in departments with high risk exposures, implementing a defensive driving program, encouraging employees to report near miss accidents and then conduct investigation to eliminate those hazards and re-implementing the City Accident Review Board in collaboration with the Department of Human Resources. The mission of the Risk Management Division is to reduce the financial impact of claims, lawsuits, employee injuries, and to reduce corresponding frequency and severity of these events through the application of professional risk management techniques and to provide a safe environment for employees to work and the public to enjoy. 
Implementing a comprehensive safety program is one key to lowering costs of claims and insurance premium. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Uh, Paige. Under the, uh, on page four. four. Page four. I'm sorry. When, when we're talking about the um, overall risk management program, does that include, uh, I know it includes the city departments, but what about the constitutional offices? Do they fall under the city's mm -hmm. risk management program? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> for, for each of uh, the categories you have here, um, is that a combination of the self-insurance and also the uh, insurance carrier? There are certain benchmarks that you have to reach before the insurance. Right, we have deductibles for those those lines of coverage. So for property, we will have a hundred thousand dollar deductible. For liability, we have a million dollars deductible. Well, I, what, what I'm asking is for um, for example, if there's a property claim mm -hmm. for three million dollars, is that the same as others where? Um, after a million, that's when the insurance carrier kicks in. If we have a property claim for me uh, for three million, the city would pay the first hundred thousand, and then the insurance company would pay the other the two million nine hundred thousand. And that's that's consistent for each of those categories. Yes, okay. yes sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, tell me a little bit about the accident review board? <coughs> Yes. Um, what the accident review board is, if, it, if an employee is in an accident, that accident will be heard before the accident review board to determine if that accident was preventable or non-preventable, and also to see if there's any training that needs to be conducted as well. So, so, so it's just to determine employee culpability or? Yes. Is that, that's basically what it's? Yes. Just to mitigate risk. Question. I, I can see how the difference in the excess workers' comp may have decreased because of the number of claims or the number of accidents that employees mm -hmm. may have had, but the small decrease that's right there with the network cybersecurity, I mean, is that because of the technology changing? Exactly. It's not as much? Yes, and, and, and that pretty much um, remained the same. That's basically industry um, standard for that. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of the council, I, I just want to chime in um, because uh, from a city standpoint, as the city attorney's office, um, certainly what the risk manager does certainly allows my office not to try to manage these particular issues from our standpoint, although we still try to watch those same issues from that standpoint. This is. Um, a day-to-day -day means of addressing issues so they don't reach our office, much like human resources and finance and others. Uh, the more we handle these issues and address them on that front, the less likely they are to get to uh, my office in terms of an active claim and, and other additional costs associated with it. So it, it's been very helpful. Uh, in the time period, Mr. Parker has been here to, to try to marshal some of those issues as well as uh, decrease the cost uh, from his standpoint in terms of dealing with the insurance company, something that my office doesn't address. Looks like he's been successful. I mean, Four months. I mean, in that short, short period of time, Four that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty months. drastic change to be congratulated. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, One of the things, uh, Mayor, and I, I um, appreciate um, Vice Mayor Cherry's uh, comment, that Mr. Parker came to us and, and shared with us areas of which, you know, I'm not in insurance, and so I, that's not my area, but um, flood insurance, when he said that a city that, you know, where we're, everything here is water, and that we only had uh, Ten million dollars in coverage, and with no additional cost. But his knowledge of knowing how to work with um, our broker, I would say, that we get fifty million. Mm -hmm. And then you look at all of the other increases, and that's knowing the business, knowing how to work with our broker, and uh, to say that we are fixed and it, our um, costs will not go up for two years, and that's guaranteed. Yeah. That's significant. That's significant. Thank you. Thank you.
Where else can we take money? <laughs> <laughs> That's important for you. Where else can there be money saved? Definitely. And, and the, the comprehensive safety program, uh, we're going to see savings by less vehicle accidents. So I'm sure next, next year this time, we'll be able to have more news for you as well by implementing those programs. Good job. Yep. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Yeah, um, um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and, and members of City Council, uh, we are at the period of um, City Council report backs, and um, you asked to bring back the status of the Greater Portsmouth Development Corporation um, in the City Council report back, and so that's um, on the table for, for you all's discussion. Okay. This new, this new council has not had the opportunity to discuss this, as I mentioned at our last council meeting. And we need to find where we are corporately on the future of the Greater Portsmouth Development Corporation. So to start this conversation, I'd like to take a poll of council to determine whether or not uh, council as a corporate entity wants uh, GPDC to go away and stop uh, living or to continue. And that is the simple question and that's the future of GPDC. And once we determine that, I think it determines then the, the nature of our, of our conversation. So I'm going to take that poll right now. Uh, well, and I'll start with my left. Well, before you... No, sir, I'm well, going to take the poll. Well, let me ask counsel, before you just simplify it as you did, because the, the issue is a little more complex than just go away, um, when you That's say, well, I'm, well, I'm the, well, no, I'm, I'm but the mayor. you can't, but you're not the council. No, and, and that's what I'm going to do. do. Well, you're no, out of order, sir. Well, I have I'm not, not out of order, you. and I don't know why you're trying to keep me from just asking a very simple question. We're because do this no, first. because you, how can you poll and ask, do does council just want GPDC to go away? Dr. And Whitaker, council is not aware. Well, I know you have the floor, but I, I have a you question. Don't, you don't have I, the floor. Yeah, I, why are you being so antagonistic with me asking? You don't even know the question I'm about to ask. Now, the question that I would like to ask of council is before we just say it go away. What is the implication of saying GPDC go away? Does that mean now that there's no discussion of the issues surrounding GB GPDC property? Does that mean it just goes away? We don't discuss this whole receivership issue? I don't know what you mean by when you say go away. I will can, you define, can you yes, define can. what you mean and by it, go away? No. It's on a course to go away now because of the fact that a lawsuit has been initiated to uh, have it cease and the property then be disposed of through the receivership. If it continues as a nonprofit entity, that doesn't happen. And so it's a very simple minute, question. What, what doesn't happen? That's what I'm not you say. Receivership if, does not happen. If what? If it continues, and that is the question before council. Well. If, that is the question no, before no, council, and no, we're going to start the no, poll no, right now. No, wait a minute, now. because that's, yes, I sir. just wanted, we got to make sure you're clear on the issue you present to council, because now you've brought in the receivership issue. Now, so, so are please you listen saying, to me, Dr. Whitaker. I am going to take a poll of council on the future of the Greater Portsmouth Development Corporation. We're going to find out what the mind of this council that is sitting at this table right. so, and whether so, or not they want GPTC to continue or not. That's a okay. simple question. Okay, so let me ask you this. If, if you say no council does not want it to continue, then what does that do with the discussion we, of GPDC? Then we talk about the receivership. If the council wants it to continue, then there is no, the, the suit is non-suited. The suit is not suited. Yeah, the suit when, to dissolve when that, G, GPDC. When, did, when was it not suited? And please listen. The simple Sorry. question is what, for this council who has not discussed the future of GPDC, is whether or not this council wants to continue with GPDC as an entity or not. It's that simple. Okay, so my question is, if council says no, yes. then where are we? Then we're, 
we're back on discussing your concerns about receivership. <coughs> if council says that yes, we want GPT, GPDC to continue, then the lawsuit goes away. Not good, but I, I, I see I, I see where you're going with okay. that. Okay, yeah. let's start. What is your position, <coughs> Elizabeth? I would keep GPDC as is. Okay, I concur. I think they've done some, some great work, um, and I didn't know what was involved. Um, so these are the properties that are owned by the three entities um, with the city um, that's on there. So I was... Hey. Question for me is: um, we, we didn't request the we didn't request the GDPC to go away or the or the or the, or the property receivership. That, that was done by by them, right? David Tinch. So, it was, so, but so, we. So, so how can we? No, we're GPTC is made up of three entities: is made up of the city, mm -hmm. the housing authority, and the Portsmouth Partnership. This city council has not had a discussion since January one as a stockholder in that corporation whether or not you want to continue GPDC or not. It was assumed in the discussions that you were, that it was going to go away. Well, and see, and, and piggyback on Mr. Terry's your, your your characterization of GPDC just then is not accurate because GPDC is not an entity which we have a stock interest in. We, we don't even have a legal third interest in GPDC if you look at uh, the filings with the State Corporation Commission. The, the city doesn't have an interest. If, if that were true, then how is it that two individuals, David Tench and Kathy Warren, who are not a part of the city, uh, they're not a part of PRHA, they can unilaterally petition the court to put property that we're supposed to have a third interest in into receivership and then council sits here and say i'm fine with the present structure i don't know if council really realizes legally we haven't seen any documentation showing that the city of portsmouth even has a third interest in gpdc because if we did how could those two individuals petition the court and now we're in front of the court over a receivership issue, which we had no no, no voice on. Okay. You so so your so your characterization, I would like to see. Do you do you have any documents from the state corporation commission indicating that the city has a third Dr. interest Whitaker, or any legal documents? You're very eloquent and making a a statement, but we need to determine as a city council what our corporate position is. But that's my point. How can council members say, let GPDC stay as it is, and the council members don't even know the corporate structure of GPDC? We have no documentation in the front of us plan. showing that the city has a third interest. And I'm not trying to be combative. I'm just being factual. I don't think any of them have any documentation showing the question. city's interest. It's not a simple yes, question, particularly how you just posed no, it. it is because how can they vote on something they don't know the structure <coughs> of? Please. That's, that's disingenuous. Please respect the chair, okay? I'm, I'm respecting the chair. I think that you should respect the council and that before you request votes, and I think they respect your leadership, before you request vote and pose things, they should at least have accurate information. And I'm asking if before that question is posed, for there to be some documentation for council to show that the city does have a third interest in GPDC. The question, I haven't seen that documentation. Okay, the question is really simple. And I'll state it again, whether or not the corporate feeling of city council is whether or not you want there to be a G GPDC going forward. But what on this, but, but, but how question. can they how can they answer that if they do not have documentation? Let them speak for themselves. Sir. Well, you're, yeah, you're speaking, aren't you speaking for council when you say what a yes vote means? Because I didn't hear council direct you to say what a yes vote meant. I didn't. I heard you say that's what a yes vote means. And so my question is simply, what documentation has council reviewed to show that we should continue with the present structure? I heard two, three council members say, yes, 
and I don't, how can they say that and don't even have documentation of the present structure? Thank you. Yes, my question, I got a question for the attorney question. Sure. Um, he's right. He's talking to you. Yes, sir. Uh, I know you're right. right. I'm looking at the properties here. If, if, and my particular interest is, is the second one from the top. If, if you say it, it goes away or, or it stays, does, what does it do to our ability to develop these properties? It, which, which does either one of those those options cost us a, a issue if we want to develop that property starting tomorrow? Uh, we do you understand my question. I do. Uh, we would uh, go back uh, and approach PRHA and the partnership to uh, put to move the organization forward so we can go ahead and move that property forward and get it out of court. That's, that's, that's if it stays or if it goes, which one? If it stays. If it stays. If it goes. If it goes, then we're still where we are. Uh, essentially, we have a um, motion to intervene and we have this motion to uh, put the matter into receivership so you have a time period going forward as to whether or not that matter stays in, uh, whether that matter goes into receivership, Mr. if it ever yep. goes into receivership. Hold on, one, one person at a time, and I recognize Paige. And he, he raised a question, how can we make that decision if we don't even own the property? That is not what, the question. What, what evidence property. do we have no. that we have a third interest in the property? That's that's the question no. that I think is legitimate. The, the, Dr. Whitaker, you have said in prior occasions, GPDC is based on a third interest for all three parties. What is the documentation showing that I'm not? Doctor, I'm not saying yes or no. Doctor, I'm just saying show us the documentation Doctor that, that Whitaker, is the present structure. Dr. Whitaker, there has not been a challenge to that particular issue. That's, I understand you're raising that issue that's now. Not my, that's not my, and, my question, attorney is. Do you have documentation showing that the city of Portsmouth, the PRHA, and the Portsmouth Partnership each has a third interest in GPDC? Yes. That's, okay. That's now, okay. Council that's should council should see that. Yeah. Council Mr. should see that documentation. Thank you, sir. Well, well, if, thank you if, for your council. Opinion. When can, can when can you, Doctor Whitaker, you, you no longer have the tomorrow? floor, sir? I don't know why you keep trying to cut me off on a legitimate question. A, no, it's a, a legitimate question because you, you, you pose you pose the question to council, mm -hmm. which council could not answer if they don't know the present structure of GPDC. I'm rule you out of order. You, you can rule all you want. I'm just saying that council <laughs> council couldn't vote on something they don't have information on. Have you not known that for for ten years? Have I not known what? That there were three equal partners. Have I, have I known that there were three or have not known? Which question I have you? known that. How do you know that? Because I've been right. a part of it. No, how do, you, how do you know that that is the legal structure? I'm not talking about I what you've been I was a part of told. it when it was formed. That's, I don't, that, but where is the documentation? If you don't care, then be quiet. No, I'm saying, I'm I'm saying where is the right, documentation? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty close of calling you out of order. You can call me out of order. Mm -hmm. I'm expecting you to do that because I'm asking a legitimate question. You, what, you which, can ask that question when we get to answered, you, sir. Which okay. hasn't been answered. All right. Page. Uh, if, if that's the case, and, and that will help us, because I know we we suddenly have interest, and we can move this property along. I want whatever it takes to move the property, get the property developed. Hey. I agree that we stay in the group and move forward. Okay. Now, Doctor Water, you yeah. do have the. Floor. How can we stay in something that we don't even know we're legally in? How can you ask us to stay in an entity that we don't know that we're legally a part of? That's my that's my issue. You don't have. You any don't know to. that. I know that we are. Well, based on what? Based on documentation I mean, well, that I've seen in the past. It. Just so, all I ask is that you supply it. That's all. But if you're saying that if we stay in it, then that means the receivership issue goes away. Yes, sir. Um, no. Okay. No, that's because good. if if that's the case, then 
by saying we stay in it, are you saying then that those who moved for the receivership, that that was a legitimate, that was a legitimate fouling? Or are you I'm saying, saying are you saying we're going to challenge the fouling? No. So what happens to the receivership? Just unsuited. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that you already know that those parties will move for the court? No, not we to won't. If the consensus of counsel, which it is, it seems to be 6-1, that we continue in G GPDC, then we'll convey that through the city manager to the other two entities, the partnership and the PRJ. Well, if that's the case, once again, how is it that there are just two individuals who moved on the behalf of GPDC? Are you, are, are, were they not authorized to do that? I was not there, Dr. Whitaker. <coughs> We're trying to determine what this council wants to do tonight. You're asking a question that I don't, I don't think that is pertinent to the issue. But, it's well, not your main. My, my concern is, is that um, this issue not go into receivership. That's, that's my concern, that it not go into receivership. Is that, is that where council is moving in that direction? No. Is, that, is that the direction? Or Six it members go into of council said they want to continue with GPDC. Dr. Pat, convey that to the Housing Authority and to the partnership and ask them to consider it. Okay, so that's my question. So by staying with GPDC, does this issue remain in receivership, or is council saying it will not go into receivership? It will not go into receivership. And then also, well, I'll let you finish that, because the next issue yeah. deals with the other matter with GPDC. All right. So that takes care of item five, which comes down to the counting of the loan payoff. Dr. Whitaker, you asked, and with concurrence of council, that the city manager worked with the housing authority and he's done that. And that is here and it's a full accounting of the seven million dollars. Can, 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 can I just say something? Sure. Because when I say the property, I guess I should, because I forgot people, public are watching, is watching this. I was, I, I was referring to the Holiday Inn site, right. the, yeah. the old Holiday Inn site. Okay. The, uh, if you got somebody yeah. for all of them, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Well, I do know that people have interest in that one now, so okay. I, but I, I didn't say that for the public. Now, despite what some may think, uh, I was not here in October 31, 2008, but Sure. Uh, yeah, I know for sure. Were you, were you here in February? I was here in February, but not when this contract was signed and drawn, drawn up, which says on page three that the city will pay to the housing authority seven million dollars to pay off the loan, the bank loan on the Holiday Inn site, and that's in um, item one of the agreement. And tab two is the wire transfer from the city. Um, that wires the seven million dollars to the holiday I mean, to uh, PRJ, along with question, the bank, question, question, bank statement. Question on the wire transfer to PRHA, um, Why is it that the seven million went into a Hope Six federal fund? I don't know the answer to that. To pay off the holiday insight. That was it. That was the name of the account that yeah. PRG set up somewhere. for that. Right, but Hope Six, Hope Six, those are federal funds. So thinking, how were city funds commingled with federal funds? That's just my question. Account for it. Well, I'm just asking. That's, That's the question I'm asking. Yeah, but I can't answer it. Right. So can, can yeah. we get can we get that information as to why city funds went into a or, or if this is a. Hope six federal That's funds. an interesting question, but I don't think it's germane to where the funds went. Well, it is. A, it, it may not be germane to you, um, but oh. you're not the sole voice of counsel. And it's a question that has been asked. If there's no objection, I'm just curious why why were city funds put into well, just the name Hope of the six accounts. funds? Uh, the, behind the transfer is the bank statement for the city that shows that uh, there was a $7 million uh, debit. Tab 3 is the wire from the Housing Authority, only stayed in there a day, um, to BB&T, which was the holder of the note. Two wires, one for $6.5 million, one for a little shy of $3 million, I mean 300000 
And then behind that is an explanation from PRHA. And you got tab four from the executive director, Dr. Yes, Patton. sir. Um, and, uh, um, and you'll notice not. the second bullet says that on November the 6th, 2008, wires were processed to bp and to pay off the two notes on the hotel, note one, in the amount of 6593029 and that's on their wire. And the other note was 298,221,052 cents. The total payoff was 6891,271.50. Remember, we wired 7 million. And they explained that the balance of the funds, the 108, 748.50 cents was used to pay the cost of doing the RFP and that was done jointly between the city and the housing authority and the partnership. And those expenses are on the next page. And this is also a PRHA document. Yes, uh, and Mrs. Winston could not be here tonight, but Mrs. Winston has worked with us all last week. So they use the balance of the funds to reimburse themselves to cover these ex expenses that uh, were legitimate, were yes. incurred, yes. and paid for. Yes, sir. The answer to Dr. Whitaker's question is right here on this page. Yeah. The notes from PRHA. It says this particular bank account was created to hold and disperse proceeds from the sale of homes constructed in the Westbury neighborhood on the former Ida Barber public housing site. No Federal Hope 6 grant funds were ever mm -hmm. in or dispersed through this account. The account mm -hmm. name referred to the initiative, not the grant. Yeah. This account was used for the transaction as wire instructions and forms were already available and because of the volume of activity in the account, there were no wire fees assessed. Mm -hmm. I think All that right. answers the question. Yeah. Now, is everybody satisfied with this accounting? Uh, can we move forward? Um, and I'm going to start. Do you have a question, sir? Yeah. Um, I just want to point out that um, these are these are bank statements uh, coming uh, from PRHA, um, and they're showing they're showing amounts. They're not showing who these amounts went to. Well, look at the wire before that, sir. Look at uh, Town Bank. And the, it's their statement of November 28th, 08. Yeah, that's what I'm and, and you'll at. see a wire transfer. That's, that's $298,221.62. Mm -hmm. so Correct. I'm about. And also $6,593.29.88. I see those. That's Those are just amounts. Yeah. It, it's, it's the wire is to bb and Right. But these other two, well, one of these amounts, the, the, whoever it went to is, is redacted. And they explain that. Okay. And then the other, the 298, um, it says here that there was a note one and there was a note three. Look at tab four, sir. And it, That's it's what I'm looking at. Okay. And um, it talks about a note one and a note and a note three. Right. And um, are both of these notes associated with Holiday Inn? They are. How you know? Because they are. <laughs> okay. They are because they are. That's what you said. That's exactly what I said. I know. And anyone of logic would not accept they are because they are. So I don't know what I don't know what that okay. I don't know what that means. I'm just saying this is this is still not telling us exactly where the funds went. And the last I see tab movement is the of monies. I see movements, but I don't see where. The last tab is the release from the clerk's office that shows that the deed of trust has been satisfied. That was never questioned. So <clears throat> My question to Retirement my colleagues, are you satisfied with this accounting so we can move on? Please. Okay. Yes. 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 No, I'll still raise issues. That's good. Answer. All right. Dr. Patton. Yes. Uh, and 
Madam Clerk, we got notice that there's a uh, request to defer one of the conditional use permits tomorrow. Yes, sir. Would did. you explain to council what we must do? I'll defer to the city attorney. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of council, you uh, you have a request to defer uh, a use permit that's scheduled for tomorrow. They're asking for a 30-day uh, deferral until a uh, council can appear on two matters before you. Um, there is a request, and I can forward you the, that request and the standard as it relates to that request. Um, because that notice has already gone out, it is truly your decision as to whether or not you decide to have that hearing or whether you decide to continue that hearing. That's not something that you have to do this evening. Um, but uh, that may be something you choose to do if you uh, decide to do so. But we uh, have some materials for you, but they have requested that it moved on to August. Or whatever the first I believe it's the eighth. Can say which one it is? Yeah. It is the uh, it is the it is the uh, cell tower. The cell. Uh, it is yeah, the cell tower. Cell tower. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was going to be said. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the yeah. cell tower. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so what you're saying is that we actually could defer the public hearing or start the public hearing and continue it. Not correct. Present. Wouldn't we just 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 do a deferral? Be, 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 because I would think be, so. because people got to come back twice yeah. mm -hmm. to yeah. speak on the same thing. If you if you if you do the public hearing and then defer, that's that, that's having people to repeat their story. Mm -hmm. Very just destroying right. it, yeah. it that way. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's. So I'd the like option. To hear the clerk. <laughs> Pardon me. I'd like to hear the clerk. She looks. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. It is my understanding, oh, mm -hmm. but I defer to the attorney because he is your attorney. Didn't look like that. But, it's, but <laughs> <laughs> I tend to do that sometimes. But it's my understanding that because the applicant is requesting deferral, and because we've already advertised the public hearing on the city side, that you have to have the public hearing. Whether you defer, approve, deny, is up to you. Right. But we have to have the public hearing to open and close it. You can defer it, you can approve it, you can deny it, mm -hmm. but because it has been previously advertised, advertised, you need to have that public hearing. We are researching whether if the city were to defer it or request deferral, would it be the same rules? But we know that we have to have, because the applicant requested it, we have to have the public hearing and you can have a second public hearing if you want, but for this particular public hearing, We're because it has already been advertised, you need to have the public hearing, and either you can defer it, deny it, approve it, it's up to you. What's the nature of the deferral? The nature of the deferral, do we know? We know? Uh, I, they have some conflicts, they have a conflict and some confusion or some delays in terms of gathering some additional information. All right, so our choice is, is to have the public hearing and vote it up and offer. We have deferred before. I mean, we're not, not had a public hearing. We have deferred before without having exactly. a public hearing. Exactly, but it's my I, I, understanding I've there's been some law changes mm -hmm. recently. So that we can't do that anymore? The, if the city council would like to defer, you can, but you have to have the public hearing. All right. Does that count as one Can we public summarize hearing? what yes. the, the that options is your are so hearing. we can decide? It sounds to me that we can, that you're saying this, that we can have, we need to have the public hearing. Mm -hmm. At the end of the public hearing, we can defer, defer action to August. Mm -hmm. We could vote it up or down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we could have the public hearing and continue the public hearing mm -hmm. to August. Mm -hmm. yes. And what's. But we're not going to hear from the applicant no matter what. No. Mm -hmm. 
I can say that I did warn the applicant, not knowing how the meeting could possibly go, they should have a representative here. Because homeowners are going to show up. Yeah. And, you, and they're going to have to show up twice, or two or three times. I think we have to listen. So, we always need to err on the side of so, listening to the public. So, so, okay. so, so if, they, if they show up, you, 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 they got to be heard. That's why if we were to, to defer it and they knew we were going to defer it, they wouldn't have to come down here twice. But they're not going to get the notice in enough time. I think, yeah, time. I think it's too short a time so, to notice. Sure. Mm -hmm. And basically, the information oh, we oh, give them, be watching we this have to be watching, have it. They'll be watching this tonight, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> it's important for us to decide tonight so that people will know. And I, it, I feel that we should be like you. Let's let's be caution, cautious in abundance. And I, again, my my feelings are is that we have the public hearing. I look to you to determine whether or not uh, we continue that public hearing to the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Is that what you want to do? I think that would be the if, best. If, if, you, if you're going to have it, you continue. You don't have, you don't, yeah. I don't want to have it and then defer it. That, that, that yeah. just seems no, I don't right. Take, I, don't need, I also don't want to take action, yeah. whatever it is, so but, we'll, so without the applicant making the presentation. Yeah. When the last speaker speaks, I will continue the public hearing to the next, to the first meeting in August. August. Everybody in agreement with that? Yeah. Yes. Dr. Yeah. Whitaker, are you in agreement with that? Mm -hmm. Still, Mayor, still be mindful that if we decide to uh, affirm the Planning Commission's recommendation, we got to have that in writing. Mayor, members of council, I, I will get to you between now and before you arrive tomorrow. Okay. All advice you need in order to make sure we're on firm footing tomorrow. But for tomorrow, we are, we're going to open the public hearing, and when the last speaker speaks, we'll continue the public hearing to the first meeting in August. Is that yeah, what I'm not willing to make a decision until I've heard from the applicant. Right. Yeah. yeah. Got to hear both sides. You can't not hear both sides. Right. Well, I've, I've, I've heard both sides. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Lisa has I, yeah. I think we have a majority of yes ma'am. I have a, a report back on the meters if, oh, if okay. this is a proper ahead. time. Um, the meters um, will be removed by the end of the week at the latest. The area is being converted to two hour parking. The restricted parking was recommended by the parking authority and um, it, it seems that it may have been reported in one of the um, city council briefs uh, a few months ago. So they're going to be removed. Thank All you. All right. Okay. We're adjourned. Get back tomorrow at 5. Thank you.